Okay. Now, it really begins to look like everybody fits in. I'm sure you can find a seat if you want one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay. Let's see now. I have to make a, a, a trivial announcement, but it's a sad news in a way. The translation, of, of when I rewrote that sentence and got rid of determinate and, uh, and made it indeterminate and got rid of empty and all that, I'm afraid the French says what our book says it says. That's sad, but it's still, with, I, I don't take back my changes. It just we need, it means we're fixing Merleau-Ponty instead of the translation, as always, a little, little less certain. But I, I, I stand behind it. I'm sure if we had Merleau-Ponty around, he'd be willing to accept those changes. Otherwise, there's, I just also discovered something else absolutely weird about the translation, and it, it, it has even less significance than what I just said. It, there are, you know, two English translations of, uh, or two English editions. We, we go through that, getting the double numbers all the time. Well, it's hard to believe but the translation that we've got is worse than the previous one. Somebody has actually gone through and miscorrected it. So that, and, and I'll give you two examples. I'm sure I'm giving them to you partly because the, the, the two sentences that are have these mistakes in them have come out complete hack and utter nonsense, and we have to fix it. But partly because I want you to keep your eyes open. When when you find a sentence that is not only unintelligible but just crazy, long-headed, come and ask me about the French, because I'm, I suspect, and I remember a few, but I didn't have to go back, and I didn't have time to go back and look, that this is happening more frequently than we would like, that some, uh, somebody who's going through this with, uh, with, with no understanding at all is correcting it for, I can't imagine what reasons, and doing it, I'm afraid, with global changes. Anyway, here's where it first struck me, on page 66. You won't have it, of course, in the other one, because it's got it right. I checked both the earlier English translation, and I checked the French, and so 15 lines from the bottom, it talks about, since inferiori in inferiority defined by the impression, it was much more fundamental since inferiority defined by the impression by its nature evaded every attempt to express it. Inferiority? What's the right word? Interiority. And lo and behold, the French says interiority, but more hair-raising, the previous English said interiority. Somebody is actually going around making it worse. Uh, and on the next page, in nothing exciting new, it happens again about 15 lines from the bottom, where he, he talks about Bergson's <coughs> inferiority. Uh, and that means it's being globally changed. Somebody has discovered that they're everywhere in the book, I bet, where interiority is used. They're going to substitute inferiority to help us out. Well, a little more help like that, and we'll be able to read anything. I'm going to call up the Rutledge editor and yell at him as soon as I get enough, a long enough list that I don't want to yell at him for one, one, but I'm sure there, there are more. So keep me posted. Come into office hours or send me email when you find <laughs> sentences that are really crazy. Okay. Now another sort of announcement. Uh, it, Rick has been telling his discussion session, and I think it's a good idea, to read the first essay in this... What? The second essay in this book, The Primal... What's the first essay? Oh, the, the unpublished thing. The, the Primacy of Perception essay in the book called Primacy of Perception. So I, in, I used to have a copy, but somebody obviously borrowed it and didn't give it back. But I managed to, And I think it might be out of print. University Press Book says it is. But I found a used copy at Black Oaks yesterday. I'm going to make four Xeroxes of this and put the book on reserve. It, it won't tell you any... What, what it does is give you a kind of nice introductory overview. It's an hour lecture that Merleau-Ponty gave on what he was up to in the phenomenology of perception. And I think Rick is absolutely right. I mean, next time I teach the course, I will put it in, get everybody to read it first, because you plunge into this talk about association and judgment and attention, and you don't really know why he's got you there. He sort of tells you, finally, in your reading for today, he goes over and says why he started where he did, or tries to give a reason for it anyway. But, so anyway, it's a good thing to read. It's very clear and simple, and I won't even Xerox 
I'll save you from the stupid comments that his French colleagues make after he gives this talk. They ask a lot of questions which show they don't understand anything, but they don't know it, and they're showing off, and, and he's answering them politely, but since their questions are stupid, his answers aren't helpful. So, I won't even bother to Xerox that, and I don't recommend that you read it. Just read what he says, and that's good. Okay, any, any, other, any questions or issues that I should be worrying about besides the ones I've just been worrying about and uh, if not we can plunge back in to the chapter on the phenomenal deal. The, yeah. Did you say that the French was online somewhere? I couldn't find well it. yes, somebody told me. I didn't tell everybody because it turned out to be slightly disappointing but it, it's not hopeless. Oh, the French. Yeah, I'm still trying to find the French. It is online, a total copy of it in, in searchable in French. But somebody told me there was in English, and there is, on Amazon. Just go to Phenomenology of Perception. However, the first two words I looked up just te testing the search, because I had the words in front of me in English in the book, it didn't find them. So I don't know what sort of search engine they're using. You, you, you can use it to find what it finds, but you shouldn't think that just because it hasn't found a word you're looking for, or that every place it has is where it is exhaustive. I can't remember now because it was about a week ago what very important basic <coughs> word I looked up. Maybe it was Gestalt and it didn't find it. Does Amazon uh, have the complete text or just part of it? I think Amazon has the complete text. Is it, who told me about it? Is it? Are you here? I mean, I, I, the, the one, I didn't go into much detail once I saw that it wasn't doing a good job, but my impression was that it was the complete text. Uh, yeah? I think it's complete text, but it's just a search, right? Yeah. You mean what? As a well, I mean, I think they, on Amazon provides them, but it's only searchable. So you can search for phrases and paragraphs, and, and you know, well, you, you can't, can't print it you out. can't actually print out. They don't no, buy it. no, that's fine. But you, we're happy if, you, if we're happy with a searchable text, particularly when the text is so weird as this one. And you'll find out that certain very important notions, like maximal grip, only come up a few times, and that's not the fault of the search engine. That is the funny fact, the most basic ideas in this book, he hasn't really got a whole, uh, got seen that they're the central ideas. They're always in the background. I'm going to try to show you how that happens in today and helps make sense of what pretty obscure stuff. And uh, maximal grip and intentional arc are two really important notions. We haven't got to intentional arc yet, uh, which he uh, hadn't thematized. But, and it helps to have this search. In fact, when I get time, I will search him. But I already searched in the French for these words, and I discovered about three references to one of them and one to the other. And motor intentionality was you that asked. Somebody asked me, and where does he talk about motor? Oh, John Searle asked me. Once, in one footnote, motor intentionality. And the, the ideas that seem, to me anyway, just absolutely central are, are as I say, something he hasn't got a full grip on. Uh, okay, now we're ready to go back to where we were, and I want to sort of sum up something and read about the idealism, try to sort out the vocabulary, which is, I think, hopeless, but try to be a little clearer than I was last time, because I feel that I didn't get it quite right. But, and, and I, uh, let's, I'm going to lay it out in an order I think is clear. I want to go back to page 10. That's where, I mean, it's just a phrase I was looking for, I, about ten lines from the bottom. We've talked about it before. Normal functioning must be understood as a process of integration in which the text of the external world is not so much copied as composed. That's, that's what's going to make the idealism. I mean, there, there, there isn't any external world to copy. There is us composing. Uh, the perceptual world. And I think the process of integration is sort of interesting because he has this terribly sloppy use of, con of constitution, which really ought to be left to Husserl and idealists just because Husserl started it. And I think integration would be a nice word uh, for what our articulation, remember we talked about that, what, what we do according to Merleau Ponty, mm -hmm. which is that it's a kind of composing of the perceptual world, integration is, or articulation is, and 
as such, it makes me, it means that the perceptual world is always relative to us, because it does. There is no perceptual world except as so far as we integrate it and articulate it, organize it is another word, and sometimes he says constitute it, and never tells you. I've been keeping my eye open. Well, how he's using the word constituted, and it flops all, <coughs> all over. So anyway, that's a nice line on page 10, which sets up page 47. I'm just jumping down to what we were talking about last time. Only I found another quote, which I didn't mention last time. I had it in my notes, but I missed it. And it's important. To, it's one of the places where he makes the distinction between the world and the universe, which I made a lot of fuss about. Unfortunately, there are other places where he doesn't make a good, a, the same or clear distinction between the world and the universe, but I'll try to explain as I go what's happening. Anyway, on 47, which is in attention and judgment, the best way is always to look for the footnote. Here, the footnote is Husserl, Erfahrung, and Urteil, page 331. That'll get you in the neighborhood. Uh, that, that paragraph on 47 ends. Uh, if, however, this de facto power is used without being explicitly posited, we become incapable of seeing past the rending of separate experiences, the phenomena of perception, and the world born in perception. I mean, never mind all that talk. Well, we, now we want to, now the crucial. If we get it wrong, we dissolve the perception and the world, sorry, we dissolve the perceived world. Remember what we, we've been using. The, the term perceptual world a lot. I don't know whether that's very frequent, <coughs> but this is a place where he says perceptual world. He's, that's what he's going to call the phenomenal field at the, when he finally gets settled on his terminology. So, and but it's a mistake to dissolve the perceived world into a universe. And the universe w is the galaxies and, and, and the molecules and everything that's there determinate, independent of us and our activity of integrating or organizing. That's it. We dissolve the perceived world into a universe which is nothing. And now, now comes the idealism. I mean, so far, anybody could agree. There is a perceived world, it's relative to us, and we can make a move in which we go to the universe, which is whatever there is, is not relative to us, and you'd be a realist. But what he says about the universe is, into a universe which is nothing but this very world, cut off from its constitutive origins, and made manifest because they are forgotten. Well, that's to say, and he always seems to think this, I mean, the universe is some derivative uh, abstraction from the perceived world. In the, in the uh, preface which you're not reading, he says that science is to the, the perceived world the way a map is to the landscape. I mean, it's a very attenuated representation of some features. And it's uh, important that uh, the universe is nothing but this, co this uh, world cut off from its constitutive origins. I mean, so you can't believe, if you believe that, that the universe is electrons and galaxies and stuff if that means things in themselves that are not relative to us. Because he's saying the universe is defined as leaving something out from the of the perceived world. I just think it's wrong, but that's what he says. And I'll go on, because all this is sort of relevant to what I said last time. Thus, intellectualism leaves consciousness on a footing of familiarity with absolute being, while the idea of a world in itself... Now, that's... The world in itself is the universe. I mean, that's... I talk about confusing terminology. It persists as a horizon, as the clued analytic reflection. So, if you make this move and leave out the way we organize our experience into the perceptual world, then if you could do that, which he thinks you can't really get away with, you'd have a world in itself, and that is the universe. I Wait. believe. Yep. You don't think so? So are you saying that he thinks that the universe is the world in itself? It's another name. He thinks that the universe, he thinks what the universe really is. I mean, people think the universe, people like me, 
benighted realists think the universe has got galaxies and electrons and water and uh, you know black holes and stuff in it and they're just like they always were and they'll be that way after we're all gone and so forth and so forth that's what that's what people think the universe is but what the universe really is is some aspect of the perceptual world which if you leave out a whole lot it, it's very uh, Cartesian or, or Galileo like in a way you leave only instead of saying you leave out the secondary qualities and you find out that what the universe is which is the realist way he thinks the universe is a kind of residue left after you leave out meaning and everything relative to perception and that you couldn't even make any sense I'll, I, I think I have it later in my lecture of the all the concepts used by science are only meaningful maybe I can find it because I was writing no all over in the margin are only meaningful relative to the yeah here we are 68 is part of the answer to what you just said Rick. Um, <coughs> Uh, science, about four lines down, scientific consciousness borrows all its modes from the structures of living experience. You don't have to believe that. You don't have to believe that quantum physics, which is a bizarre phenomena that he doesn't know about, but it, it refutes him. I mean, we, these, uh, these particles that are waves too and go through two slots at once and the weird uh, entanglement that they talk about and so forth, that's not modeled on living experience. Science has a perfect right and capacity to come up with totally new concepts, alien to everyday experience, to describe the, what they discover out there as the properties of, of things. Let me finish that paragraph, three lines from the bottom. Uh, the pre-scientific life of consciousness alone endows scientific operations with meaning. And these, and to which these latter always <coughs> refer back. Where is that? That's now at the end of that paragraph on 68. Okay. Now, again, just like again, I just think that's wrong. I mean, I don't see how quantum weirdness refers back to our everyday experience. Uh, and but that's what he thinks, which means that, that that the universe is there isn't any universe in itself. There is what science talks about, and what science talks about is relative to us. Okay, so just to get the terminology yeah. clear, um, Merleau-Ponty has a distinction between the universe and the world in itself. And it seems like he wants to say there is no world in itself. Right? That's the prejudice of the world. That's the problem that right. we're against. Right. So he's got a story of science where he's going to call the object of science the universe. And you think that the world in itself is the universe. Well, that's, no, I, 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 that's interesting. Let me think. We dissolve the procedure into a universe which is nothing. Yes, that's true. So he thinks there is stuff that science talks about. What science talks about is the universe. But science thinks the universe is in itself, whereas, in fact, the universe is a kind of abstraction from the perceived world. And it's a kind of cultural construction, he says later, about nebulae and uh, I, as I keep saying if, if this was an important part of his philosophy I would I didn't say it this way but I, w I wouldn't be teaching it and I would hope you would all leave but uh, this is not an important part of his he does, it doesn't matter to what's important in Melody that he's an idealist about the universe it doesn't play any important role finally in his argument uh, and so he, we, he can he's okay I and mean, he's, he's as okay as Kant which is pretty okay remember Kant for those who had it is an empirical realist he thinks Newtonian science isn't about things in themselves it's about appearances it's about the phenomenal world but as it's as about the phenomenal world it's about inner subjective agreement and loss of control and beautiful uh, structure and he and Merleau-Ponty is like that he said, very like a, like a Kanji. Yeah. Well, given what you just said, you may have just answered my question, but it sounded to me like you were saying that Merleau Ponty is making sort of a strong metaphysical claim that uh, about, you know, a kind of a sort of different kind of idealism that the universe and electrons are just something, you know, we make up or they're all relative to us. But I, I read him as sort of just making an, an epistemic claim that. Um, the kind of knowledge that science gives us is only possible against the background of our sort of ordinary understanding of the world and things like that, which 
Okay. You might agree with yeah. if you're yeah. coming from yeah. Heidegger or something. But I think that epistemic claim is, is he turns it into a metaphysical claim because he really wants to say, and you can see it around the notion of determinate, there is nothing determinate. There is no determined, there, in the, the perceptual world is never fully determinate. It's always just in the process of getting determinate. And, uh, it, and the idea that there's a universe out there that is determinate, that, that <coughs> metaphysical realist claim, he thinks, is false. Because there's, we, or at least, that there's, I, I think he thinks it's false. I, I don't know if he thinks it's unintelligible. He certainly, yeah, I, I, I don't know how he would have the right to think it's unintelligible, but I have a feeling he does think it's unintelligible because he thinks that if we get access to it only through the perceptual world, then it must be that the perceptual world is in some way necessary for it. And that it's such an, uh, a loser argument. I mean, he doesn't have a concept of access. He doesn't have a concept that the practices by which we find out about the universe could be completely accidental to the structure of the universe. That however we find out about electrons, which is very interesting and the sociology of science can study it, those are not essential properties of electrons. They're contingent properties that they show up in, it's under certain conditions and you can use them to bombard things and so forth. And there's stuff out there, at least it's intelligible to suppose, that has its own structure and uh, uh, we get access to that. Anyway, so, but he thinks, he turns the epistemological, to put it your way, into an ontological claim that there couldn't be any completely determinate thing in itself because our only access to it is through the perceptual world and the perceptual world isn't going to ever be determined. I, I, I find it strange to be defending Merleau Ponty here. But oh, I'm think, glad you are. I think you can take determinacy to be an epistemic notion as well. Oh, um, I don't see that. Well, let me think about it. Uh, so, the perceptual world is only experienced as determinate. But then why would he say that it's a kind of illusion that we have to break this crypto mechanism that we think that there is an, an objective determinate world? Uh, if, why doesn't he just think that's, I mean, why doesn't he think, like, like normal people think, <laughs> that, that we discover this objective determinant world through our epistemological, our, our capacities for learning about things, and that it's only insofar as it's our learning about it that it's indeterminate, but really we find out through our learning about it that it's determinate. He has a name for that. He keeps criticizing those guys. What does he say? He says that, uh, oh, that's the préjugé du monde. That's the, that's the prejudice of the world. Oh, that's the, uh, what's the other word for that? The experience? Pre prejudice of determinate being, and then <laughs> that's in conjunction with the experience error. Okay, oh, experience error, that was the word I looked for. Yeah. These are all pretty insulting sounding notions for a, just an epistemological distinction, I think. So we can discuss, we have to discuss it more. But I would love to, I mean, if, if there's a way to defend him, I would love to defend him. He's my second to Heidegger as far as being somebody I think has got a lot of truth. Yeah. Um, but you don't think this um, argument against his, his argument, his objection to his argument, holds with respect to the perceived world as well? You do I what? It doesn't hold with respect to the perceived world as well. It only holds with respect to, to um, the world characterized by quantum mechanics and so on. He doesn't hold what with respect to the perceived world. Um, you don't think the same objection could apply. Right, you right. No, no, right. Point. Good point. I have to keep saying that. And I found a place, but now I've lost it for a moment. But keep your eye open for it. Where he thinks, certainly he thinks the perceived world is always somewhat indeterminate and always being made more and more determinate in some direction and being losing its determinacy in another. And I even found a place, I wish I had grabbed it, where it see maybe I've got it in my notes, but I don't think so, where he says, in effect, that it happens extremely fast, which is what I want, in microseconds, the world is taking, oh, it's got to do with the, the vegetable kingdom and all that funny talk. Where is that, where we are supposed to experience the vegetable kingdom taking place, in, in effect, in milliseconds, in front of our eyes? It's a big footnote somewhere, isn't it? 
Yeah. Maybe. Isn't, isn't it in that huge footnote? Let's look. Because I was surprised to see that, and I like that, that he thinks that, that the world is indeterminate, but it's all, but we're constantly making, very fast, making, making it determinate. I mean, we normally don't see that. You have to slow it down with the ship example. But where is, you, you're supposed to see like the beginning, the vegetable kingdom taking, at every moment, we've got to find it, at every moment, trees and nature and all that. What? I don't know yet. I mean, I'm not reading yet. I'm just saying what I remember. At every moment, trees and nature and everything like that. There we are. There we are. 50 and 51. So now we're in attention and judgment with the footnote, the faculty of judging. Okay, let's look at this. This is just another claim. Let me see. I'm, and this is just I'm agreeing with him. One, that Merleau Ponty thinks that the perceptual world is indeterminate. And I agree with him that he, he convinces me that it is. Uh, that there is, it, it, that we're always organizing it. What was the word we just found back there that I liked? That's page six. Too many things in the air. Integrating. We're doing, is that integrating it? Yeah. Now, here's what he says here. When I glance rapidly about at the objects surrounding me in order to find my bearings and locate myself, I scarcely can be said to grasp the world in some instantaneous aspect. I identify here the door, there are the windows, and so forth and so forth, which are given to me as simple meanings. When I contemplate an object with watching it and so forth, then no, no, this isn't getting to be what I want yet. Uh, I become aware that each perception, not merely that the sights which I'm discovering for the first time, reenacts its own account of the birth of intelligence and has some element of creating an intelligence about it in order that I may recognize the tree. Ah, uh, here's the line. In order that I may recognize the tree as a tree, it is necessary that beneath this familiar meaning, the momentary arrangement of the visible scene should begin all over again. That's a really strong claim. You walk into the room, and very quickly, you've got to make sense of everything. It gets very easy, and you, get, you can do it very quickly in microseconds, because you're very familiar with this room and chairs. If you walk into a strange enough situation, like the mass in the ship again, where he found one to slow you down, it takes you a while to arrange it. But it's very interesting here. Um, the, the momentary arrangement of the visual scene should begin all over again, as on the first day of the vegetable kingdom, to outline the individual idea of a tree. So I that's think the secondary act of attention. That's the secondary, yes, that's, that's the role of secondary attention, the normal attention. Normal attention. Only it's missed by the people who are doing it. It's so fast. I thought, is it, I, I was very suspicious of this because I, I think it's always dubious when, when a philosopher tells you that something happens so fast or so marginal or so small or so unconscious. Uh, it's, as I heard, the, the joke goes, it's like excusing an illegitimate child on the grounds that it's a very small one. It sounds like he's saying uh, that, that it goes so fast you don't have to worry about it or something. And so I asked Walter Freeman, my, my neuro Merleau-Pontian, is it, do you think it's so that the brain has to actually start with a kind of chaos and disorder and organize that into an attractor every time I recognize an object like a tree, even if I'm familiar with it? And he said, yes, it takes, I forget how many microseconds. But he, he, he with his electrodes on rabbit brains, says he can actually see the brain correlate of this happening. So that's fine. I'm ready to buy that. Uh, it's, it happens so fast you don't see it. Uh, it doesn't, you know. You therefore think, we're back to the crypto mechanism, you therefore think that you are always encountering determinate objects because this, this ordering it, what was the phrase here? There's some arranging of it happens very, very, very fast. And sort of outside consciousness, not in some unconscious place, but just too fast for you to see it. Uh, that, okay. So, so the important point is that you're answering the question yes. about uh, uh. how how we can accept what he says about the, the perceptual world. Calls, uh, yeah, I accept what he says about the perceptual world. Of course we have to keep constantly arranging it and ordering it and taking some things that were in the background and un indeterminate and making them a figure and making them more determinate and losing other bits of determination. That's just how it goes. Therefore, it seems sort of obvious. I can't imagine 
how anybody would want to deny it. If it weren't for us, there wouldn't be this kind of perceptual world, always becoming more determinate but never completely determinate. If that's how it is, that's the strong claim. If that's the phenomena, then it clearly depends on our capacity to arrange it. Uh, that's now, yeah. You know, I, the only of our yeah, yeah, well, I, that's why I was hedging. Can I want to read the question. Yeah, and she, I, she's calling me on saying that it takes place outside of consciousness. That is it, the wrong way to put it. What? What's the it that takes place? Yes, the, this arranging of the world. And he wants to say, he says, I'll get there in the lecture, that, that it's the job of phenomenologists to describe this process. And yet, he also seems to say that it can't happen so momentarily that you don't see it, and uh, it's very hard to see it. And how does he get us to see it? Well, two ways that I can that I can think of. One, I keep saying he's brilliant at finding sort of breakdown situations that slows it down, and that's how we find ourselves trying to arrange the ship and the and the and the trees, the mass and the trees, and there's this instability, and we're sort of uneasy because we can't get a good grip on it, and then. We do, and that's one way he does it. The other way he does it, and this is now a pitch for you to read the Cezanne essay in uh, Sense and Nonsense, which I've got on reserve. It's great artists, particularly Cezanne, and maybe only Cezanne, as far as I can tell from reading him, have been able to see it and slow it down enough to paint it so that you, when you look at a Cezanne painting, you experience this coming into stability of the objects in it. That's why they're painted so weird, and yet you don't know they're painted weird. It's a brilliant essay. Anyway, so, it, but it happens usually so fast that you're not aware of it. That's, that's, that's a better way of saying than the, the outside consciousness. I mean, you, can't, you can't see it, it just goes too fast. There are things in the world all over that go too fast. The fluorescent light is flickering at 60 cycles, <coughs> and, and, but you don't see it. Uh, and uh, that's it. But, but it's, it's the job of the phenomenologist to convince you, to get you to see it in special situations and to convince you that, of course, it's happening all the time. And this thing about the tree is fascinating. I mean, I've never paid attention to it before. It's a very interesting, strong claim. And so says Anna, paint trees like that. You paint trees coming into stability as trees. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to follow up on James's, James's comment. I don't see why there's the, why the natural world and the world of science is different from the perceptual world and why the reasons for me. Like, well, what the reasons Merleau Ponty is giving us. You pointed out that the fact that I access to the scientific world is conditioned in various ways doesn't mean that electrons depend for their existence right, right, on us. Right. Well, the fact that our access to the perceived objects, the lectern or the examples that you were just discussing, depend on our... No, it's right. It doesn't mean that any of those... No, no, you're right. It doesn't mean it. And in fact, the prejudice du monde, the world, prejudice of the world and the crypto mechanism and everything, according to him, hides it. And common sense and the meaning of even our words don't capture it. So it's his job, and that's tied up with what I said to her. He, he doesn't think it's obvious at all. He thinks it's his job to get us to see that even though uh, it could be the case. Maybe I'm missing the point. I'm, I don't know yet. I mean, you, you, you're ready to say, of course, we're having this experience of organizing. I, I think that I misunderstood you. But why couldn't that be that we're not that we are per, uh, composing it, but that we are getting back, representing it, getting I, it right I, about it? I, I see your point. I now. haven't understood any reason to think that the lectern is any more mind-dependent than the elect electronic. Ah, very, I see your point now. Very interesting, very good. I missed it. And I think uh, that's what James was sort of, was I, see. James was ah, I see, well, that's, that's good. Let's so we should have the prejudice of the world about percept the, the, per yeah. the perceptual world as well. He, yeah. Either he ought to be an idealist about the perceptual world and the world of science, or he ought to be a realist about the... That's... And, but you can't have it your way, which is being a realist about one, but an idealist about interesting. the other. Interesting. Oh, dear. I have to think hard about this. Let me see. Uh, I, I'm certainly not happy with 
these alternatives, so I see exactly what you're saying. And they, they, I have to think about it. So, yeah, I mean, make uh, Alva's point in the simplest possible way. So take the tree example. So in X microseconds, I organize my experience of the tree. Why shouldn't I think there was a completely determinate tree all along? And this is how I come to perceive it. So that I didn't compose it, I copied it. That's what you're saying. And if you can say that, uh, and, if, and wh if I'm going to say that about electrons, that science copies them, it doesn't compose them, why shouldn't I say it about trees but there's another and electrons? Yeah. Yeah. There's another is that you neither compose it nor copy it, but encounter it. Access. Access. That's what you mean. Direct, directly access it. And so we can have direct knowledge of electrons and direct knowledge of trees. No, no, that I can, easy, I think, I agree with him. I want to resist that. That, that, that's, that would say that you don't have in your experience the coming into uh, determinateness of your experience of the lectern. He thinks that with his Manuel Ponti story and with his masts and ships and with endless other stuff about motion, about space, about time, about everything that the whole book is going to be about, that he's got a story about how stable objects with stable properties are composed by your bodily response. But I'm not going to give that up. But, but you use your metaphor. That's, that's what you need to do to get a grip. Yes. But getting a grip on something isn't inventing it. And oh, he's clear about it's that. Clear. Well, that's fine. I mean, there's, so there are three levels. Let's see. There's we. I'm assuming that he can tell us how we, uh, how we come to get a determinate, stable experience of trees and electrons. I'm also saying we don't have anything like that. Sorry, not electrons. Trees and lecterns. I think I'm saying there's no story about how we come to get a stable grip on electrons of the same sort. Uh, there's, a, there's a sociological story of how we get to discover them. That's all right. But it isn't as if every time a scientist sets about to think about electrons, he has to uh, compose them because he's thinking about them and not perceiving them. If he's perceiving something, like through a telescope or something, then of course he has to go through this constitution thing. But, oh, it's so complicated. If what he perceives, I'll just say this once more and put it aside, has a nature, a natural kind, and essential properties, then the process he goes through to perceive it is clearly irrelevant to what it is. That's, and I, I just think that's, that's okay. That's that, the prejudice of the world. Well, that's the prejudice, well, that's, yes, I suppose so, except that election isn't a natural kind, and that's important. Well, wait a minute. Uh, so, but, um, but I'm, I want to worry about the first thing he said, which is much harder. Why can't we say that we're just perceiving, that is, copying, that is, I mean, this, this, is, this isn't just a trivial objection from, from Alva. This is what everybody in the cognitive science business thinks. I mean, I, I, everybody, say Alice and Gopnik, for instance. I mean, they, they've got this idea that what we're doing is making, learning to form the representations which copy the way things are and the things are completely determinate, and the representations are determinate, and it takes a little bit of indeterminacy to get there, and Merleau Ponty's making a big fuss about this indeterminacy it takes to get there, but what right does he have to say that we're composing the world instead of representing it? Uh, that's the question. Uh, it's about the perceptual stuff, not, uh, never mind the science. Yeah. Following all this point, I, I think there are three possible positions here. Okay. One, that we are creating the object, and that's right. just idealism. The other, that we're representing the world, and that's, that's indirect realism. So then there's right. the third option, which I think he was suggesting, which is that we have access to it, direct access, and that would be a direct realism. So we have indirect realism, idealism, and direct realism. And uh, I thought with Heidegger and all that, your story would be the access story. To everyday stuff. Direct realism, yeah. And that's not incompatible with this talk of composing, because composing can mean sort of two things. It can mean like cooking up, but also if you think about composing a photograph, it's sort of deciding what's going to, or not deciding, but making something the foreground and something the background. And, uh, you know, just a simple shift, shift in perspective can change that without you inventing anything. It's one thing to organize your experience, which, which would make sense of that. It's the other to organize the world, creating the world, and that's where the idealism comes in. 
So it seems like if if we're composing, you know, here's an organizational sense in our experience, that's one thing. But if we're actually organizing the world to create the object in the perceived world, that seems to be the kind of idealistic. I was trying to agree with you and yeah, yeah, give a reading that would be a direct, yeah. more direct realist. And yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jennifer. You have to square the direct realism with this indeterminacy, determinacy talk. And this is the problem, I think. That's right. We yes. it. It's turning in. I mean, it keeps. There are two different yeah. issues. I have no question about what Merleau-Ponty thinks. He, it, it's not epistemological with him because he actually keeps saying it's a mistake in your metaphysics to think that there's a determinate world. He, this is Cartesian. He says, "Wow, there are these subjects, and they have." access, however, to a determinate world? No. He's got a whole story, and the whole book is a story about how we make this stuff determinate. Not just our experience of it, but we make the perceptual world determinate. They, that he believes. Now, I think the interesting problem that Alvin has posed me is, why does he think that? I mean, what's the argument? It may end up having to say, that uh, we don't know yet. There's a funny footnote where he says, only when we get to the chapter in time will you understand why this is transcendental idealism of the sort that I'm giving you. I don't remember how the chapter on time is going to help, but I guess he's going to argue like Kant that if time is uh, dependent on us and the kind of bodies we have, and somehow argue that there wouldn't be any time if it weren't for that, I don't know how he's going to argue that, uh, then he'd have the right to say, what Alva thinks he doesn't have the right to say, and I grant you, I don't see he, how he has a right to say it yet either, or, other, or whether he ever will, that at some point the idea could be that we have direct access to determinate objects, uh, and uh, the, the, the description of how our direct access to them has to become determinate in our experience doesn't show that it's metaphysically wrong to think that the every, this world is made up of determinate objects. I take it. That's, that's what you say. And I think that's right. Do you have an answer? You look like, wait a minute, There's somebody up there, and then I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just to add, this, I guess this, this, this example might just reinforce the whole fact that maybe things were determined from the get-go. Like if we imagine you know, like a camera taking a picture of a tree, uh, it does, it's very passive. It kind of has a receptive goal, right? It doesn't... Interesting. Yeah. Ah. Now, I'm sure the photograph itself is just this vision, this receptive force. Now, it's true that when we're looking at the photo photograph ourselves, we are kind of composing. We know that, you know, this is a branch, this is part of a leaf. Good, if good. If you show it to a fly, it might not understand it that way. So it's true that we are composing from that perspective. So, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like we have to talk like we're inside our own mind and outside our own mind. It's very funny. It's like the quantum business. I mean, it's as if somehow everything gets gets uh, resolved into indeterminacy until you look at it and make it determinate. Not only the picture, but the tree that it's a picture of isn't uh, isn't just there, completely determinate, such that if the uh, you and the you and all human beings cease to exist, there'd still be that determinate tree. I think that's what he thinks. I mean, it's, I'm glad we're having this discussion. It's very illuminating to me. I've never realized how completely weird his position is. I mean, it is really strange to claim that there is this composing, uh, or if that doesn't work, what were these other words? Finally constituting, but I don't like that word. Organizing, articulating, going on. And uh, there's something there, by the way. We don't make it up out of whole cloth. He's, he, he's got there. There are uh, boundary conditions on what you can make of it. The tree and the photograph, you can't look, you can't turn them into a picture of an elephant. Uh, but given those boundary conditions, it's only when you get the right set, you unlock it, and it becomes determinate uh, in your experience. And this is the amazing move. And there is no determinate perceptual world. It's the perceptual world just is the world as you experience it. Uh, why does he think that? I have no idea. Yeah. 
I think why he thinks that, and I think he's wrong in his thinking, uh, has to do with the first couple pages um, with the experience, error, and the prejudice of the world and the constancy hypothesis. So, so I'll actually suggest something like this uh, last week, I think, where he wants to criticize the scientists who are starting with the prejudice of the world understood as the scientific universe, the world in itself. And that if you start with that, and if you throw in the experience there, then you're going to get this understanding of perception as you know, external stimuli, mechanisms, producing sensations, and you're not going to have room for the indeterminacy of perception. Good. So he's going to start off by recognizing the phenomenology of the indeterminacy of perception. Good. Right. And this is part of, I think, James's point about the epistemic issue. And okay. then he's going to confuse this to an well, that's well, So it that's seems. So it seems, so first we, let's just give ourselves an assignment for the rest of the semester to keep our eyes open. I mean, I don't think it's any problem to see that he thinks that he, that uh, thanks to Gestaltists and going on beyond the Gestaltists, he's got a story of how in our, each, in each person's experience there is indeterminacy taking and turning into determinist determinacy and it's all like the masts and the ships uh, happening all the time only very fast it's when he turns that into metaphysics and says and that shows there aren't any determinate objects in the everyday world uh, that move I have no idea where it comes how he can justify that is that what you're saying well, that's he, so he tries to justify the science but then he's just wrong I think yeah. that's part of what James yeah. was suggesting right. confusing the epistemic access story mm -hmm. and turning it into an ontological I see form. that's right but we add now something you and Alva were just saying or you were attributing to Alva it looks like he thinks that if it were the determinate way that uh, mm -hmm. the prejudice of the world thinks it is then we would be, I don't know whether tempted or forced to have the wrong view of perception, that this determinate thing sends out determinate waves that get picked up by my sense organs, which are transducers, and gets processed in the brain up to the point where I am able to recreate uh, in my experience the determinate object whose uh, information and energy was sent to me. That becomes very hard to resist, I take it. That's part of the thing. He thinks there's no way to resist that wrong-headed way of thinking about it except to realize that this is a phenomenal world of appearances which has to be made determinate all the time. Once you think that, then you're free to have a kind of Walter Freeman neuroscience uh, and a Merleau-Ponty uh, phenomenology of perception. And you can just say, well, the usual way of thinking about perception and the usual way of thinking about how the, how the brain deals with it is just wrong. But, uh, but that doesn't give him the right to say it. I, mean, I think to say that if you don't hold the view his way, you can hardly resist holding a view which a lot of people like him and me think is wrong. It's not enough of an argument. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Can we close that door? There's enough background noise I can't hear. Yeah. It seems like the, the problem is our idea of um, what constitutes an object, like a picture of a house in our mind, is an example that it, it's like we see the house from every single angle that we can imagine. And if you think of it in that way, it's like the object is a collection of our perceptions. And it's, in that way, it doesn't really make sense to say that the object as a collection of our perceptions, as seen from every angle, really exists in itself because in that sense it exists as seen from every angle with perceivers surrounding it. I don't know. Let's I see what you're saying. Wait till we get to the chapter on the thing. I mean, I don't know whether what you're saying makes sense or not, but it's too hard to go into at this point. But he's got a, he's got, I mean, maybe it's true that our view of what it would be like to be a completely determinate house is somehow incoherent or can't be put together with our experience of the house coming into uh, determinacy. Uh, that's, I think, what you're saying. I don't know. Keep your eye open. I mean, that's what you should watch. Where in this book and how often and with what sort of arguments is he going to get you over into his idealist camp? That I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and as possible paper topic, it's sensational. If anybody finds the, the argument and makes it persuasive, that's an A-plus paper. Okay, now back to where we were. 
Yeah. It's going to be hot in here if we close the door, isn't it? Yeah. Close, we'll open the door again. I'd rather have <laughs> noise than everybody going to sleep in, from the heat. Uh, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm just going to catch up because I'm already way behind where I want to be. <laughs> I, I don't think this is a waste of time at all. Um, let's look at 48. This is all part of the same argument. Maybe it'll be helpful. Um, hence, philosophy with two guises and, uh, and observable in any doctrine of the understanding. There's, so here's what philosophy has. A leap is undertaken from a naturalistic view which expresses, oh, I see. This, by the way, I, I, I just quit. So the flaw, because this is not his view. This is a thing of, of, I wanted to show you a typical not Merleau-Ponty passage. This is visceral. He says, what you go is, you bring up a, a subject who is a constituting agent and exists only, and, and the subject exists only for the constituting agent. And uh, I should be only one and so forth. There's the idea of absolute constituting consciousness, and that's the and the other side of there being an absolutely determinate universe. And I just want to read the last sentence because it's interesting when Merleau Ponty is giving you a visceral kind of con that's constitution in a very strong idealist sense. There and and he says authentic reflection instead of turning from one to the other, that is the universe is completely constituted, created by transcendental consciousness, or the universe is completely determinate already. Those two views, which are just the subject-object view from Descartes, taken to their natural extreme, he says authentic reflection, that's him, instead of turning from one to the other as, as both true, that's Descartes, in the manner of philosophy of the understanding, rejects them both as false. I mean, there is no, for him, the idea of a totally constituting consciousness that just sort of puts together objects out of highlighted data on the one hand, and the idea of a completely determinate universe in itself, you've got to give them up. That's a subject-object metaphysics, or sometimes later you'll see in our reading, I just want to tell you so you'll recognize it, he switches over to Sartre vocabulary, where a Cartesian subject is a for itself, and the objects are in themselves. That, that, for, that subject object, or for itself, in itself ontology, he's rejecting them both as false. That's sure. Um, and he has a right to do that regardless of what the answer to our previous question is. Because he can say about these people, they don't understand the process of perception by, way, by which we get access to the perceptual world, and he can, that's a different point than whether the, the world we get access to by our perceptual process has been determined all along, or whether it being determined depends on our access, which is the Alba's question. So, so and what interests us is the, and it's a story about how we come to have the perceptual world we have. And then he wants to say, not by being a pure transcendental consciousness, We've got to be embodied in a way that I'm going to come through right now, and and we, and we and not and it's not because we are sort of pure open reflectors of a completely determinate world and universe which is already there. That's that's out of the question. I, I mean, I think he makes that case absolutely convincing. I mean, he's got plenty to say against Husserl kind of uh, constituted phenomenology, and plenty to say against any kind of behaviorist empiricist information comes in from the world out there and the brain just reconstructs it. Uh, line. So let's go on uh, to 54. I'm, I'm, this is all supposed to be just reviewing. Um, the 54 one is the... So, now see, and again, in the light of this discussion, you can see what extreme views he's got here. He says, in the middle of the page, however, the Gestalt psychologists, I put in Gestalt, who practice the description of phenomena are not normally aware of the philosophical implications. And I don't think that's just epistemological from this point of view. They do not see that the return to perceptual experience insofar as it's consequential and radical puts out of court all forms of realism. See, there he goes, James, right from epistemology to metaphysics. That is to say, all philosophies which leave consciousness and take 
as given its results, its results being a world and a universe of things in themselves. The real sin of intellectualism lies precisely in having taken as given the determinate universe of science. Uh, so, there we go. Um, so, Merleau-Ponty now has this view, I'm going to skim this because we covered a lot of this in our discussion. See where I like where I am. Well, if we can get right around, of course, just to remind you of the what? I got, I've got a page in the old book instead of the new book. I wonder where the crypto mechanism is in here. I'm just going to remind you of it. Here it is on page 67 in here. I mean, this is just the other half of the story that we cover up all this activity of making the, the perceptual world determinate. I mean, that's a view he's going to hold, and I think rather plausibly, no matter whether the perceptual world is determined all along or not, uh, the crypto mechanism. I mean, I'll wait a minute, maybe I'm not making sense. Uh, let me read it. Nothing is more difficult than to know exactly what we see. There's a natural intuition, a sort of crypto mechanism, which we have to break in order to reach phenomenal being. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I think I was wrong. I mean, that's another metaphysical claim. That says that the. the that there's something in us that hides this making determinate of the indeterminate and makes us think wrongly the metaphysical view that everything is determinate. That's how perception hides itself and enables things to be constituted. That is, makes us believe in the metaphysics of the determinate things, I believe. So, and so there is no a world, no determinate world, no determinate universe, and it's our job to describe uh, the, and now this could be uh, just epistemological, which would be fine, because that's what he's interested in doing, about five lines down on 66. The first philosophical act would appear to be to return to the world of actual experience, which is prior to the objective world. Now you can hear that prior as necessary in order to get an objective world. And then that's fine. Remember, I keep saying, don't feel that you have to drop the course or give up on Merleau Ponty. That's for him the interesting issue to describe the way our perceptual activity gives us the experience of a determinate objective world. Uh, and then covers up the activity by which it did that. I mean, that's, that's what the book is about. All this metaphysics is just him trying to one-up science, I think. Well, also, and, and also head off a bad account of perception, which you, you're almost driven to if you take the, uh, the view he doesn't want. So let's see now. There's a shared perceptual world, it's an intersubjective world, and we take it for granted in our experience, and we can uh, study how we came to have it. And now I just want to set straight some vocabulary that I was not very clear about, uh, although Rick corrected me. I mean, there is a public shared world. Let's call it an intersubjective world. But, and he uses that term somewhere, but I didn't find it. But uh, that would, I mean, he wouldn't deny it. Uh, but, it's really not only an intersubjective world you'll see later, it's an intercorporeal world because our body organizes it in cooperation with all these, my body organizes it in cooperation with all of you guys' bodies. And uh, if you say intersubjective, that's too much buying into Cartesian talk. But there is a shared intercorporeal world, only if you think that's an objective world, he hears that as making a metaphysical claim that there is a completely determinate world in itself already there. So I last time said this shared intracorporeal world that, that's got all the stuff in it that we've got, it's okay to say that's the objective world, but not the way he's using the term. The objective world for him is a metaphysical misunderstanding, and I had to straighten that out. So I think I just did. Let's see, I have quotes. Let's see if I know how many I have to read. Uh, by the way, well, here's one that's back a little bit in what I said. Uh, about five lines down in 62. He says, the decisive moment in perception, is that's what he wants to talk about, the upsurge of a true and exact world. I mean, that's 
what he's interested in. How that comes into stability. Of course, he's always hearing it metaphysically too, how there comes to be a true and exact world <coughs> at all. That's his metaphysical spin on it. Um, and now this is now this is getting to the phenomenal field, the middle of the page. The criticism of the constancy hypothesis, more generally the reduction of the idea of the world, opened up a phenomenal field, which now has to be more accurately circumscribed and suggested the rediscovery of, of a direct experience which must be at least provisionally assigned its place in the relation to scientific knowledge and psychology and philosophical reflection. So that's to say, and I keep wanting to stress it, the phenomenal field means that there is some way that we organize experience so that we've got this shared world and that's what he's interested in and he wants to understand how that that phenomenal field is opened up by us and our active bodies did I see a hand back there you're all right everybody's all right okay let's see then 62 um, and he's just against what he's talked about in the next paragraph that there is a truth in itself in italics which is the reason underlying appearances there isn't any reason there may be maybe in Kant and maybe he'd be happy with that some unknowable thing in itself which somehow puts the boundary conditions on what we can take to be what but there isn't any world with any content, any description, any structure in itself, according to him, uh, which explains why we have the experiences we have. It's got to be turned around and see it the other way. Uh, okay, so much for that. 60. So he wants to, about... 66 lines, 66 about six lines down, he wants to return to the world of actual experiences, experience which is prior to the objective world. I keep repeating this now in the new language we've got. Well, it's at least prior to it in the epistemological, uh, chronological sense that we've got to keep doing this job before you have it. And he thinks also metaphysically prior. So he, skipping down a bit, our task will be to rediscover phenomena, the layer of living experience in which people, other people and things are first given to us. You see, that's okay, that's safe. The system self, other things, is coming into being, reawaken perception and foil its trick. That's the crypto mechanism of allowing us to forget it as a fact and as perception in the interest of the object which it presents to us, the determined object. And the, and the tradition which and so forth. Uh, okay, that is all okay. Now comes the whole attack on uh, introspection. I'm not, I don't have to say much about it. I just recommend that you read 66 and 67 because when you tell people that you're doing phenomenology, they will inevitably think you're doing introspection and they will think that introspectionism has been shown to be wrong, which he would completely agree. That is, everybody just sitting there inactive meditating on their own private experiences, get all sorts of weird answers. <coughs> the different in, in, in introspectionist schools of psychology got different answers. As I think I mentioned, my favorite is the Buddhist meditating of Varela in his awful book, The Embodied Mind. But I wouldn't mind Varela had doing his Buddhist meditation and coming up with the idea that there are no selves and no objects. But in that book, the idea is that's what Merleau-Ponty was trying to do but he did phenomenology, but we, doing meditation, do it better. But meditation is certainly introspection, and if there's nothing further from what Merleau-Ponty is doing, he can't, he's, dis he's separating himself for two or three pages from doing introspection. And he even says, in this nice footnote on 67, that he will be indifferently, it, listen, will pay attention to internal experience, uh, and, and external experience of perceiving subjects. That is, he's interested in how I experience uh, the trees and the masts taking shape. He's interested in sort of a gestalt description of a, how a whole population of people all agree that this figure is similar to that figure. That's all right, too. The one thing I think 
he's against, and that's the, the meditation in, in perspective story is, that you could be a passive, reflective observer of your experience and find out anything important. Because he thinks for two reasons. One, you're really an active, engaged, embodied coper, and, and, and that's where you find out what's important about experience. And second, reflection modifies what you're uh, finding and gives you false stuff. Uh, so that you've got to be able to unreflectively catch yourself or observe people, it doesn't matter which, in their embodied interaction with the world if you want to find out what he wants to find out, which is uh, the nature of perception. Uh, the, the thing about how reflection falsifies things I thought was pretty important, so I'm going to look for it in a minute. Can, can yeah. I put note yeah. that? Right. I don't think that Bavella thinks that um, phenomenology is introspective or that meditation is introspective. So no, I think okay. he just misunderstood it. Okay, I think, no, I, well, well, look, I, go, the, I think that Varela thinks that phenomenology, and I've talked to Varela a lot about this, that phenomenology is introspection and Buddhism is better in this introspection. But I'll find you the quotes next time. Uh, and if he didn't, that would be terrific. Uh, and, but, and, and maybe he doesn't. I mean, you can all, anybody who's got the embodied mind can try to figure, find out. Um, okay, so now where reflection misleads you is on 72. About two, uh, two-thirds of the way down. Reflection is truly reflection, only if it's not carried outside itself, only if it knows itself as reflection on an unreflected experience and consequently as a change in structure of our experience. So if you want to find out what your experience is, then you don't want to do it by doing something to it that changes its structure. You'll just find out what, what happens when you reflect on it. And so, so it's, what he's doing is not in perspective. This is sure. I mean, never, we'll find out what Varela thinks he's doing. But what, what Merle Ponty thinks he's doing is not in perspective and not reflection. And it's a tricky job of finding out what, I, what our experience is like when we're actively engaged in coping with the world unreflectively sort of in flow. Somebody told me they thought this book is all really at the phenomenology of sports. I think that's a nice way to think about it. If sports are people most engaged in the flow, unreflectively, dealing with the world, that's the model Merlo ponty wants. That's how you find out what it's really like to be a perceiving human being. So that there, there's, a, there's a university of sports in Norway, for the chancellor of which is a Merleau-Ponty scholar, and who there are big fans of Merleau-Ponty, and Merleau-Ponty would be happy with that. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've just been thinking of the, the photograph uh, analogy seems kind of misleading to me because it's, it's like a, it seems like the, it can seem like the photograph is an objective capture of uh, different things, but it's like the, the, the camera process is is built to uh, replicate our eye sensation. And with the lens replicates our retina, uh, you can't have structure, and uh, the, the chemistry is reproduced, the color. That, uh, that's a reproduction of our sensation. And it's not a reproduction of our perception. So we have to interact with the photograph like the fly can't do. I see. Well, don't, let's not go back to that. I mean, you're, you're right, but, I mean, but yeah, it's, it, it's true. The photograph is, is doing the, the, what do you call it, getting this, the uh, sensation. It's getting the sense impression. It's get, what's the, these words? I never can remember. The, the constancy hypothesis. I mean, what's on the, on the film is like what's on the retina. And the question then becomes sort of, and uh, what, what, what does that tell us about perception? And Merleau Ponty would have to say not much, because the the role of what's on our retina isn't what people think it is. It isn't sort of giving us the the picture of the world which needs to be cleaned up and fixed up a bit. By as and when it gets to the highest level, we'll have a good picture of the world. Now I don't want to go back, just that because the time is really running out, and I'm very far from where I want to be. Seventy. Where are we? Um, not introspection. Okay. And then you can have an objective science of, uh, of your of, of first-person experience. Searle says that rightly. The Gestaltists understood that. That's what they were doing. And Merleau-Ponty's footnote says that. There's no problem with this with that. Now, the the, the important thing is, and I, that's what I don't want to miss. 
that when he starts this chapter on the phenomenal field, we're now finally to the phenomenal field, which is, that I'm going on next time, by the way, no matter what, so read for next week the, the problem of the body, at least that first section of the problem of the body. I hope to get to the phantom limb talk next week, so try to get over the, over the weekend, try to get through that assignment. It's 30 pages, it's not impossible. But now, we're here we are in the phenomenal field. And he starts by telling you about a whole bunch of affordances, which are nice, but we can just, we're on page 60. Then he tells you about how things that afford, uh, uh, well, what? For, oh, well, and anti affordances. A child sees a candle is repulsive once he gets burnt by it and all that. This, and this is just good uh, Gestaltist and uh, Gibsonian like talk. The, what I want to focus on is 61. This, which struck me as important this time I was reading it through, the third line. Sense experience, on the other hand, well, let's see, right on the other hand, what? Well, there's no pure quality, he said that lots of times. Sense experience, on the other hand, it, which are not like sense data, that would be pure quality, red patches here now. Sense experience is responding to affordances. Sense experience invests the quality with a vital value, yeah, you know, to eat, to walk on to run away from. Uh, grasp it first in its meaning for us, for that heavy mass which is our body, whether it comes about that it involve, always involves a reference to the body. Well, that's a sentence which I think is interesting. The first thing is, it's so important that all of this is done in terms of its vital value for us. In my, I don't particularly like that jargon, but it's the same point I keep wanting to say. It's our engaged experience when we're trying to cope with the world we're trying to get a maximum grip on it. That's the, uh, that's the bottom line for him. That, and he'll come, I'll give you other quotes. By the way, just for fun, you should look at the idea that of that heavy mass that is our body. Have I ever told you this totus thing about why I've got body and world on the list? I mean, if you keep your eyes open, you'll see that Merleau-Ponty never tells you what the body is like and never makes any use of it. Uh, as Totus said to me once, I mean, if a Martian read Merleau-Ponty, he, he wouldn't have any idea what human beings were like. They would just be this sort of heavy mass that moves around. That's the one thing the body does. It moves around in order to get a better look at things and a better grasp of things. But a battered body has a front and a back, an up and a down, a right and a left, and it moves forward more easily than backward. And uh, uh, it copes with things that are in front of it and balances in a gravitational field. All of this is what Totus is interested in. It's super important. But Merleau-Ponty, you can't do everything at once. He hasn't really got an idea of the body. The body for him is, is I, it is the capacity to respond to the solicitations of things and the solicitation of things are their vital significance to me. It's to get, get the affordances, get a, get a grasp on your coffee mug or get a, be able to walk out the door. So now let me go more on about that. So I'm trying to get a better grip on my, the world. My experience is always promising. The world, the perceptual world is promising me more, calling me to follow solicitations. And I'm partly repenting my previous time teaching this. And for years, I've said, well, the point is to have a set to go around the house, for instance. Let's talk about a house. But you're set to, to if you go around the back, uh, around behind it, you'll see the back, if you think it's a house, that if, you, if, if you take it as a house, and so forth. I think that's not capturing the vital values story. It's not that I'm simply set to see more. It, and this is, this is the slogan that you've got to keep in mind all the time in this part and everywhere. I'm not just set to see more, I'm not just ready to see more, I'm drawn to see better. That's the vital norm that he's, got, he's built in. That we're always drawn to get a better grip, more detail, firmer grip. And that makes everything different. That turns all this talk into talk about norms. It's always not a question just of other possible perspectives. It's always a question of better perspectives. Uh, that, and I want if you look at uh, the primacy of perception, you'll see that that's the crucial point of the article. I'll just call your attention to it. He says perception isn't, can't be understood in terms of possibility or necessity. Take that with a house. 
if you're a Husserlian, you think that you've got a or a, 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 a mental structure of a house, and it shows you the necessary. It tells you the necessary properties. Like, for instance, it's necessary that if it's a house, it'll have a back. That's not what perception is like. These narrow kinds of things. Well, maybe it's then got to do with possibility. Then we get to somebody like C.I. Lewis, who sort of converts the the clusteral pre- or position of this meaning that tells you the necessary structure of a house to possibilities. If I go around, I'll see the back. That makes the back not a necessity, but a possibility. But Merleau-Ponty says the neither is right. The back is an actuality. But that connects with his constantly thing, which I stress, saying, remember, it's the presence of the back that matters. It's the presence of what's under the spot that interests him. How something can be concealed, but present. And that's what we're worrying about. And he says, so the back of the house isn't necessary and it isn't possible, it's actual. That's, he has all kinds of words for this. And it's I real. Do, real? Yeah, real. Not actual? Real. You sure? Really, actually. Really? Okay. <laughs> I've, I've misremembered it. I haven't read it for a while. So but, but it's actual. So not necessary or possible, but actual. And I'm just trying to call your attention to the fact that this is tied up with all this talk about vital things. One more passage on 61, about 12 lines down. Sense experience is that vital communication with the world that makes it present, makes it present as a familiar setting of our life. See, it's not just looking at the world. It's not, uh, it's got to, this thing he calls vital communication is constantly trying to get a better grip. It, it is to that that the perceived object and perceiving subject owe their thickness. It is the intentional tissue, which is, which is, which the effort to know will try to make, take apart. Intentional tissue is another word for the actual or the real. I mean, it's supposed to be, or thickness. These are all words for the same thing. And I had another one that I wanted to do. Start with the house. So, so yeah. the point is, it looks like it has a backside. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't matter. This is not telepathy. I talked to Rick about this in office, uh, before office hours yesterday. It, the point isn't whether you can tell from the front of a house whether it's a facade or a house. That would be telepathy. That would be impossible. That would make illusions disappear. The que- if, if you've been on a set in which you've seen lots of facades, then you don't even have to believe it's a facade. You're just taking it. You just take the next building as a facade. It looks like it. And if you take it as a facade, it looks like a facade. Or if it looks like a facade, you take it as a facade. Well, it's the other way around. Both. I mean, once okay. you've been surrounded yeah. by facades, you see facades. Then that means that it looks thin. And if you've been uh, walking down a normal street with normal houses, and you don't even notice you walked onto a movie set, then it will look thick. It will look like that, that not only does it have a, a necessary back and a possible back, he isn't denying that, it also looks, and this is the important thing, like it has an actual or real back. And present right then, not just deductively has to be there, necessary, not just possible that if I go around I'll see it, but actually there. And he can only get that argument going, and that's what I want to keep stressing, when he brings in this vital function. That is, the vital function, oh, there's another, I know what I'm looking for, my last chance here. There's another fascinatingly obscure passage which I think I can make sense of with this. It's got to do with facticity. Now let me look over here. Um, By the way, there's this whole history of modern philosophy from 62 to 65, which is fine and brilliant, a really French achievement, but it's just like a French philosophy paper. You could skip it and you, it wouldn't hurt anything for, the, for your reading of this. So there's the world experience there. Okay, 71, I think the vital thing comes back again. Yes, at the top of 71, that's the last thing I'll read, I got one minute. If then we want reflection to maintain in the object on which it bears its descriptive characteristics and thoroughly to understand the object, we must not consider it as a mere return to universal reason, this is old stuff, and see it as anticipated in unreflected experience, we must regard it as a creative, be careful there, that just means articulation, 
operation which itself participates in the facticity of that experience. Now, I thought that was rather obscure. It, what it means to participate in the faculty, in, in the facticity of the experience is, you are solicited by a call to get it better. I think that's, that's what it's got to mean. And that's why there's a place now where he says that we, we, there's no separation between us and the world. Uh, I think I have to give up. It's too bad. I think I can find you. Uh, but, but, but no separation between uh, us and the world. Oh, well, let me... Here, quick. It's, it, notice it's not Merleau-Ponty from the middle of 69 to about 50 <coughs> lines down on 70. And then it says, now the phenomenal field. He says... Uh, that we reveal. And now, if I could just find that there's this interesting... Ah, he talks about... The, it's the vital point again. I'm going to read this chunk starting in the middle of the page. That all of the gestalt is fast for a while, may be expressible in terms of some internal law and that sort of... Their experience is not the external unfolding and so <coughs> forth. It's not because the form produces a certain state of equilibrium, solving a problem, the a maximum coherence, making a world possible, that it enjoys privilege such and such, skipping down. It is the birth of a norm and is not realized <coughs> according to a norm. It is the identity of the external and internal and not the projection of the internal to the external. That t norm talk and identity talk is this vital significance talk. That is, the, there is there, my being solicited to cope with something and something showing up as having affordances for me to cope with is the essential is the total interconnection between internal and external. So it doesn't even make sense to talk about internal and external anymore. Okay, I did it. I talked too long. I'm sorry. I'm stopping.